Dr. Adam Baker. Thank you, Yang, for that very kind introduction. I'm very honoured to be here to address uh, a very learned audience. I'm sure you'll perhaps find lots of holes in my presentation, but hopefully I can entertain you and enlighten you a bit. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Andy Phipps, who is the business line manager responsible for driving forward the Moon program in SSTL, and uh, Professor Sir Martin Sweeting, who, thanks to uh, a certain amount of vision 20-something years ago, uh, set up Surrey Satellite Technology and has taken it to where it is now, where we have a genuine chance of leading the UK exploration of the Moon. My presentation will not tell the story of Surrey Satellites. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with that. It will talk a little bit about why we want to go to the Moon, uh, what's of interest at the Moon, some ways of exploring the Moon and furthering the science and other objectives in the UK, and it will outline in some small detail moonlight um, and leave, I think, a lot of the exciting detail of uh, the moonlight mission, the penetrators, to my colleague uh, Rob Gowan, whose talk will follow mine. So why the moon? Why bother? We've been there, haven't we? A little before my time, but uh, we've been there. Well, there are many arguments um, first and foremost scientific, but also technological, commercial, educational, inspirational, societal reasons to explore. And the Moon is our nearest neighbour. The fact that we've been there uh, is really the starting point, and we've only explored a very small fraction of that. Some of the arguments to explore the Moon and improve scientific knowledge are based around the origins of the solar system, trying to understand how it formed, how long ago it formed, why the Earth and the Moon and the other planets exist in the state they are in. There's astrobiology questions that could be answered from the Moon, meteorites that may have fallen on it billions of years ago, around the time of the formation of the solar system, and preserving that record of the, uh, the early days of the solar system. The Moon could be a life science laboratory as part of the long route towards Mars and people on Mars. The Moon is a fabulous place to do astronomy. Any of you who've taken the trouble to set up a telescope in your back garden in the southeast of England will realise the southeast of England is not a good place for astronomy. There's too much light. If you do radio astronomy, there's too many people using cell phones and microwave ovens. The far side of the Moon particularly has none of that, and it could be an extraordinary place to peer into the depths of the universe. There are resources on the Moon. Some often talked about a helium-3. Well... That's a little controversial one, but I haven't got time to go into it here. Some say that President Bush instigated the uh, ex space exploration vision because he thought there might be oil on the moon. Well, we'll leave that one open for debate. Um, the moon provides infrastructure. It's a solid platform on which you can place a stepping stone perhaps to the rest of the solar system. The moon, then Mars, or perhaps the Mars, then moon. That's an often debated topic in exploration circles. Um, and the moon is an excellent place to act as a test bed, to try out technologies, ways of living, ways of working, things such as rendezvous and docking, working in a harsh environment that could really prepare us for human exploration of Mars, which I very much hope to see uh, before I retire. The other thing, of course, is that we want to go to the moon because it's there. Um, this is actually one of the most downloaded pictures on the entire internet. It's called Earthrise, and it was taken not from the lunar surface, but from one of the early Apollo missions that circumnavigated the moon but did not land. Uh, possibly Apollo 9, but correct me if I'm wrong. The other one that I'm sure you've seen is of, um, I think that's Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon. You can see in his visor reflected the, uh, the eagle lander and some other instruments. These things act as inspiration they're the sort of things that will get young people away from their Nintendos and watching the television and potentially studying science and technology. They did it for me, and I've been working in space and aerospace for about uh, 10, 12 years now, and I'm sure they've done it for a lot of you and hopefully for our children as well. So just these simple pictures are a very good reason to carry on the exploration dream. Now... Around the world, there's a lot of talk, planning, some hardware, to do with going to the moon. This is somewhat out of date, 
And uh, what you tend to find in most space uh, mission circles is that everything shifts to the right in time. So if you look at uh, the American ones, well, currently they're talking about 2020 to land. Uh, 2006, two years ago, it was 2018. Sometimes things shift to the right at the same rate as which time advances, which is unfortunate. Um, but there are many missions that are there already. Smart One has been and gone. Chang'er is in orbit around the moon. Selene, now Kaguya, is also in orbit. LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Observatory, is set to launch later this year, I believe. It's undergoing its final testing at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And there are many other extraordinary missions that will really surround and blanket the moon with a plethora of scientific instruments. So there's a bandwagon, perhaps, to jump on, you could say. Look at it another way, who's actually going in particular? Well, obviously, our colleagues over the Atlantic Ocean, they've been to the moon before and they want to go back. This time to stay is the phrase. Russia, not to be left behind. China and Japan are already there. India will launch Chandrayaan later this year. I'm pleased to say that Surrey Satellites actually has some hardware on board that, a payload processing device for its um, synthetic aperture radar looking for water. Germany, sadly, has uh, had its funding pulled back for its proposed lunar orbiter, but that may reappear. ESA has done smart one and is currently debating how it may next go to the moon. And the UK, more on that later. However, you may not be aware that many other nations have expressed a strong interest in going to the moon. Nigeria, one of our biggest customers at SSTL, extremely interested for political, perhaps scientific reasons as well. Korea, with a huge growing aerospace industry, is very keen to launch a lunar orbiter. And commercial companies as well. And these are some of the pictures of previous moon missions. So Clementine, Smart One. This is uh, the sadly now defunct Lunar A mission, and you will perhaps recognize these are in a slightly different form later on in Rob's presentation. This is Kaguya, and this is a visit I had the good chance to make to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center a few weeks ago to see the LRO uh, qualification model, and they allowed me to put my hand on it so you know that that wasn't flying to the moon. <laughs> so lots of people going to the moon, and of course the question then is do we want to get left behind? But you have to have good reasons other than the kind of feel-good factor and everyone else is going factor. So in the UK, we're exceptionally good at scientific research, world-class research. Um, particularly, we're interested in lunar geology. If you go to the Natural History Museum, there are a number of professors and a number of rocks. The two interact occasionally. Um, but we have a very good lunar scientific community in the UK, and we had the opportunity to work with them uh, on the Moonlight Study. In the UK, we have some other capabilities, small satellites you may have perhaps heard of. We have a number of companies that have very innovative robotic technology, autonomous systems for descent and landing and operating in extreme environments at great distances from the Earth. And we are desperate to encourage more young people to study science and technology. The educational outreach factor cannot be ignored here. If the economy is to grow if the country is to maintain its position relative to all the other nations doing great things. We have to have people in science, technology, engineering, the STEM subjects. And going to the moon or having an active space exploration program is an extremely good way to do that. However, there's always a however. Money is limited. Uh, sadly, we don't have the budgets of our colleagues over the at the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So there may be, perhaps, a budget of around £100 million that could, with a lot of work, it's certainly not there yet, no bags of cash going to SSTL or anywhere else just yet, but that's the sort of budget that the government has unofficially said would be a reasonable sum to do a low-cost mission to the moon. Now, if you recall, I mentioned earlier some of the reasons to go to the moon. Well... You then have to think in another level of detail, which is say, well, we're going to the moon. What do we do once we're there? You can orbit the moon and you can land. Those are the two main things to do. You can also bring samples back. That's the next stage of the game. Now, orbital science, however, because of the number of missions that I mentioned earlier, uh, has largely covered the main questions that can be resolved from the... Um, uh, from the near-moon environment. Not entirely. There are a few things like improved lunar gravity mapping. Uh, there were some uh, 
predicted holes in the Selene or the Kaguya data set, although NASA has now come up with the GRAIL mission to fill those holes and generate another data set. Uh, the scientist that we interacted with, Ian Crawford from London, was interested in high-resolution X-ray fluorescence. This is a way to map the chemical composition of the moon from orbit, which is rather easier to do than, than landing building on some lower resolution results from Chandra, Chandrayaan and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. However, those are of sort of moderate scientific interest. In this country, the powers that be will only fund a lunar mission if it can generate world-class science. So remember that, world-class science. And to do that, you have to go to the surface. It's the same for all the other planets. In fact, you can gain a limited understanding from going into orbit or looking at them from a distance, but you have to go down and explore on the surface. And there are ways of doing that that I'll go into more detail on a, another slide. Penetrators, impactors, soft landers. Now, assuming that you have a mission that can get down to the surface, what are you actually looking for there? And this is a, a sort of a broad story. I, I hope I'm not boring any of you, but it's, I think it's important to understand why we are in the position we're in today and where we might go tomorrow. So there are two particular things, um, one of which is you're trying to answer origins questions. And really that's all about working out how old the moon is. So there are a number of areas on the moon that they think are sort of untouched or unexplored material, particularly basaltic type, volcanic type rocks in the lunar highlands. Um, in particular, this sort of area here, and these small points on here actually record where the various missions went. No mission has yet gone to the far side of the moon, or at least to land. No mission has explored more than 38 degrees north or south, for that matter. So there are large areas of the moon completely unexplored, and to really understand how the moon formed and how the rest of the solar system formed, and the two are linked, you have to explore in more detail. The poles, the highlands in particular, and the far side. And also you might want to get some reference points from places you've already gone, and Rob's talk on the penetrators will, will show you how we propose to do that. The other thing is what's called ISRU. This is an acronym for In-Situ Resource Utilisation living off the land, if you will. If you want to go and explore the solar system, you cannot take everything you need with you. The space rockets would be simply too large. So there is hope that on the moon you can find water in ice, which you can then turn into rocket propellant. You can turn it into drinking and washing water and, and other things, and also elements that you could then manufacture metals and propellant tanks and many other useful things with. So there's a strong desire to look in the South Pole area, particularly in craters that may never see the light of sun, to look for water ice. There is a strong suspicion it may be there, but as yet there is no direct proof. So why go to the moon's surface? Origins, how old is the moon? And Isru, can you find useful things there to do uh, in order to help further exploration? And there are many other slightly smaller questions that are also of interest. What happens with prolonged exposure to lunar dust? The Apollo astronauts commented that they could feel this sort of gritty dust almost in their mouths and they could smell it when they came back in from EVA. And there are big questions about how that affects seals and electronics and many other things. What happens for spacecraft that sit on the lunar surface for long periods? Well, if you go to one of the previous missions, a surveyor or a lunar, you could take some samples back and find out. And there are also the conspiracy theorists. <laughs> so, did we go to the moon? Well, I'm convinced, but there are a huge number of people out there who aren't. And, of course, one way to dispel that conspiracy theory is to go back and say, look, here are the remnants of the Apollo program. Here are the other things that were there. We did go to the moon. It's not just a huge fake effort set in some giant tent in the Nevada desert. Um, so going back to a bit more detail as to how you access the surface, um, there are a number of different ways, some harder than others. So penetrators are designed to plow into the, the lunar surface and essentially penetrate under it to a certain depth, typically a few meters. And they can be braked to some degree or unbraked. Now, if they aren't brake, the deceleration shock is really quite enormous. So really you have to apply some degree of braking, a propulsion system, and then a penetrator becomes a miniature spacecraft in its own right. And this is one of the big design challenges. Um, and as Rob will tell you, the success story of penetrators has not been great so far. But I won't steal his thunder. Impactors are another way of doing it. The Ranger missions were eventually very successful. Um, and these, as far as I remember, were not 
braked, um, although you can have braked ones as well, braking as in rocket propulsion to slow you down, because when you're in orbit around the moon, you're traveling with a velocity of about two kilometers a second, so about the speed of a, a particularly fast rifle bullet. Um, so you want to slow down, otherwise you're likely to break all the instruments you're trying to take to the surface. The Ranger one had a huge, essentially a large balsa wood sphere, inside which were some fairly simple instruments, and it survived the crash landing. Crude, but it worked, and a relatively inexpensive way of doing things. Um, soft landers, well, this is the real art, and it's been done before with Luna, with the Russians, Surveyor, and of course on Mars with Viking, Mars Polar Lander, less than successful. Uh, Phoenix, more recently, they finally got it right. Um, and you really want to have a, a low touchdown velocity, a few meters per second. So something that your legs, the legs on the lander can withstand to, and then you can stop and you can bring much more sensitive instruments. So mass, spectro mass spectrometers, um, uh, radiation counters, wind velocity things. There's a number of things you can bring. Uh, if you can land slowly, but that's more difficult. It requires guidance and very careful control on the descent. And then finally, the holy grail, if you will, is sample return. This has been done for the moon. Some of the Russian lunar missions did this, three of them. Um, but again, it's only been done for the near side. And of course, a big hot topic in the scientific community is Mars sample return, but I won't go into that. But sample return from the moon would uh, have some useful uh, benefits for future Mars sample return missions. Now, um, when you're going to the moon, and uh, this is, bear in mind the context of, you have to get to the moon and orbit it before you decide whether to drop penetrators or impactors or then decelerate for a soft landing or eventually come back. What are the mission drivers? Well, the, really the key one that drives almost everything else is the rocket that gets you there, the launcher. And how much will this cost? And is it reliable? Has it ever launched something towards the moon before? And there are many rockets that are very reliable at putting things into low orbits around the Earth, but have never gone beyond that. And are they available? Can you buy them? Uh, you can't simply go to, for example, uh, Orbital Sciences in America and say, well, I'd like one of your Minotaur rockets, which is small and relatively inexpensive, because unless you're a US government customer, then you're sadly not welcome. Uh, the payload, that's the other key driver, is what do you actually want to put on the surface of the moon? How much does it weigh? How big is it? How sensitive is it to, uh, shall we say, descending faster than intended? And those who are involved with the Beagle 2 mission will be sadly aware of this. Um, do you want mobility? Are you happy to stay in one place? Or do you want to rove around rovers or other ways of getting to things of interest nearby? Um, and how much does it weigh? Because weight or mass is a key thing for getting things uh, places in space. Then you've got to get to the right place to do the science. You can't just land anywhere. You want to land ideally at the edge of craters where matter from further down under the soil has been thrown out and you can collect it fairly easily without having to drill deep into the regolith. That's more difficult. And the key. The real key to a low-cost mission is having the right technology. You've got to be able to say, we know what this instrument or propulsion system or structure weighs, how big it is, how it works, and how much it will cost. And if you don't know that, you're rapidly heading for disaster. And I put this lovely science fiction picture up, but it's not science fiction. This is a NASA mission called GMO, Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter, and it was really an excuse to fly a nuclear propulsion system. NASA didn't know how to build a full nuclear propulsion system. They didn't really have a strong scientific justification. The price tag started at $2 billion and went upwards, and a lot of the technology was wholly untried, particularly as far out as Jupiter. So this is a lovely example of the way you don't want to do a low-cost mission that's likely to happen anytime soon. Now, in SSTL, we have a slightly more down-to-earth approach, and we were very fortunately funded by what was then PPARC, is now STFC, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, um, a couple of years ago, to look at options for low-cost missions, remembering the figure of no more than 100 million pounds. That still sounds a lot, but compared to exploration mission costs, which can run into the several hundreds of millions or billions, that's not a bad sum of money. So we looked at Moonlight, Moonlight stands for Moon Lightweight Interior Experiment. And really, this is an orbiter, because that's the easiest part to do, but still a challenge for SSTL, which hasn't launched something to the moon yet. Um, and it would, in orbit, do a number of things, communications relay, demonstrating that for perhaps future missions that might need additional telecoms capacity, perhaps some remote sensing, 
a camera, at least you'd need. Um, and then the key would be multiple micro impactors or penetrators, so getting down to the surface, as I spoke about earlier. We also looked at moon raker. Um, raker, I think, to do with the fact that once it got down to the surface and it's a soft lander, you'd want to rake up some soil. No relation to James Bond, I'm afraid. Um, and this is a small soft lander, so roughly 100, 200 kilograms, that would land on the near side and it would bring a geophysics, so um, uh, heat flow and seismometry, and key, a geochemistry payload, which is essentially a mass spectrometer that would allow you to date some of that unknown rock that would give you a very good idea, much better than we have today, how old the moon is. So Moonraker is really the one I think that we'd like to go for, but that is two jumps ahead. Moonlight is challenging, but I'd say that's one jump away. So for the time being, Moonlight is what the UK is most interested in with a firm practical hat on. And I'd like to thank, in fact, the Surrey Space Centre for their role in this. Um, they acted as an extremely good interface to a number of UK lunar scientists who came up with the sort of observations that would be needed or the measurements that would be needed on the moon to do that world-class science that the government is willing to fund. Now, uh, just a little bit more about getting there. Uh, Low-cost technology, the sort of things we do in Surrey satellites, are typically fairly heavy. Uh, it's not carbon fiber composites all the way, you know, the sort of things you have in tennis rackets and golf clubs and high-performance cars. It's typically a lot of aluminium, which in space terms is fairly heavy. So you've got a lot more mass than you might like to have to get to the moon. Going to the moon is also difficult. Well, no surprises there. Well, how difficult? Well, really, you need a velocity change of another two to three kilometers a second to get there. So once you've gone through all the process of getting from the ground up into orbit, which is difficult in itself, that requires an enormous amount of energy, you've then got to give it a further kick, almost a third as much again, to go to the moon. Then once you're there, you have to stop, uh, otherwise you will just simply sail straight past. And the early moon missions did that. Um, hence, you're going to need a capable launcher, but at a cost as well. So two ones that we looked at were Soyuz Fregat. Fregat is an upper stage that's designed to kick things beyond low Earth orbit. So Soyuz obviously used to launch the Russian cosmonauts, very reliable launcher, very reasonably priced, at least in launcher terms. Fregat would be what would kick a mission out towards the moon. And then, in fact, uh, Moonraker was particularly suitable for this one. PSLV, Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, that's one developed by the Indians uh, for small missions. And this one is very attractive in price terms at roughly 10 to 15 million euros. Um, and this could launch about 800 kilograms to TLI, Translunar Injection. So that'll kick it out beyond Earth orbit on its way to the moon. And the key, really, once you've thought about the launch, is, is to address the minimum requirements, what is the least that you want to do, because missions will always tend to grow, that people will like adding little bits, little sensors, little extra things to do, because once you've got over the hurdle of getting a mission funded, everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon and kind of ride with you to the moon. There aren't many opportunities. So once we thought about the launches that were available, and there are many, we said, right, what are the minimum requirements we can address to do a lunar mission that will interest the UK government and the science community and the educational community within that tight cost cap. And the launcher at 10 million or potentially 60 million is a large part of that cost. If you remember 100 million pounds, well, that's about 50 million pounds just there. You don't want to really be spending half of your moon mission budget on the launcher. So at the moment, we're not considering that one. Perhaps when budgets are better in the future, uh, as and when, we may do that. But everything's pinned on a low cost launcher like PSLV at the moment. So economics, I keep mentioning money. Um, to fund a mission to the moon, and this is sort of stepping slightly sideways a bit, the UK publishes a space strategy every few years. They've just published a new one. I wrote this presentation when the old one was still, was still in use. And there are a number of objectives. So science in particular, increasing productivity by using space in various parts of government and commerce, and developing innovative space technologies to improve quality of life down here, so biomedical things or advancements in, in robotic technology that can be used to help disabled people, for example. And the government says if we're going to fund space missions, there has to be an economic return. We can't just plough a load of money in and say, great, that's a brilliant mission, wonderful, everybody loves it, and then see no return. So the economic return is key. So how do we justify 
exploration and a UK mission, bearing in mind that the UK puts most of its space money into the European Space Agency, which is a somewhat slow and not necessarily the most efficient way of doing space missions, but it, it has its merits. Um, so from a UK perspective, well, it's going to cost a lot of money, £100 million, maybe more. Uh, how can we offset this cost and make sure we get some money back? So can we collaborate, partners out there? Can we make money on it? Difficult. You can make money on some space missions, telecoms, but no one's ever made money through going to the moon. They've spent a lot of money. As a saying, how do you make a million pounds in the space industry? Well, you start with a billion pounds. Um, um, perhaps if key science can be done, that can then develop spin-off technologies or know-how and understanding, which could be sold or somehow turned into economic return. Um, Something to bring the whole of the UK science and engineering community together. That's seen as a useful thing as well. And finally, education and outreach. Harder to quantify, but crucial for the long-term success of the, the economy. And this, in fact, the, the document that is a little hard to see on the right there is the case for space, which are a number of economic reasons for why we do space, not just exploration, but space activities in general. So remembering the collaboration one, um, about a year little over a year and three months ago, uh, NASA realized it didn't have enough money to do all the things it wanted to do on the moon, and it started canceling the robotic missions, the inexpensive ones, canceling the robotic ones. Strange way of doing things, but they... Um, and at the same time, the UK said, well, we'd like to work with America. The UK has a good relationship with America on a number of things, from defense to space, so we signed uh, a joint statement of intent, signed by Mike Griffin, the administrator of NASA, and Sir Keith O'Neill, director general of what was then the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, we're going to cooperate and exchange information and do things together. A government document that says we're going to do something but doesn't say what. And sadly, that's still where it stands. There's a lot of interest in doing something together, but nothing's actually happened yet. Um, however, we have done things in the UK. You can download this, and there's a website address there. I think these presentations will be made available, so you don't have to scribble to write it down. But this is a very interesting report that I was asked to contribute to, the Space Exploration Working Group. All the reasons, scientific, commercial, outreach, and otherwise, for why we should do exploration and put money into it in the UK. Um, worth a look through, if you have a spare moment. At the same time, we looked particularly at how moonlight and similar missions could be done in a collaborative fashion. So the joint working group report, actually, was put together between NASA, BNSC, and a number of people from industry on both sides. And again, that, that's also worth a look, because it basically says, no surprises here, yes, we can collaborate and do great missions together. Well, that's a start, but you have to then actually start doing this. So, moonlight. This would be one way of doing a low-cost mission, getting some science done, world-class science done, inspiring, exciting people, and probably a whole load of other things that we haven't even thought about yet. And SSTL, as a leading provider of low-cost satellites, is very well placed to lead this mission. In fact, we are... We are have in our business plan that this is what we're going to do. But it's not just SSTL. This is a Team UK effort, remember that. And that's something the government, I think, would be very pleased to see if we can bring all UK-interested industry and academic parties together to do this. And there are a number of parts, some of which we, we have, some of which we don't yet. So we have a heritage baseline or a, a baseline design that we can adapt based on GeoVe, which was launched for Galileo. There has been some work on communications and navigation test payloads, uh, again for Galileo. Uh, some avionics that we have, so things like attitude control and onboard computers and things like that, that can work around the environment of the moon, and some that we may have to buy. Sadly, the low-cost launcher does not exist here in the UK. Some of you may remember the days when we had a low-cost launcher, uh, and we cancelled that a month after or a month before I was born, I think. Um, so we, we have to go elsewhere, and uh, the Indians have been spoken to in some detail, and they're keen to work with us. We need an energetic propulsion system to decelerate you once you get to the moon. The launcher will do some of the job, but not all of it. And you need some way to talk to the satellite when you're uh, out there by the moon. It's a, a considerable distance away, as you're aware. And then the key thing, the key science package, the reason this all exists, is the penetrator system. And at that point, um, Rob will take over. So um, I'm almost at the end of my talk now.
Um, one more thing that I, I will say, just before the last slide, is on communications relay. So if we could build a low-cost orbiter, regardless of what the penetrators actually do, and that will be challenging in itself, one of the things we could do is offer communications relay for other missions that may be on the surface or maybe in orbit around the moon. So this is an opportunity. Many, many missions going to the moon, as I've explained earlier. Um, and one could have a, a consortium of companies that could develop a service provider model. We're very good at services in this country. Sadly, not so good at hardware as we used to be, but very good at services. And we know how to put government money together with industry money, the Skynet 5 military communications program being a very good example. And we're keen to make some money out of this. Let's be honest about that. So there's an opportunity there, perhaps, to do this. How would one do it? Well, uh, assuming there are landers down there, you would need to have a way of receiving their data beamed up from the surface and then essentially bent pipe communicating it back to Earth. Low rate links you'd need for critical data, astronaut voice, uh, astronaut health monitoring. High definition TV from the moon, never been done yet, although the Japanese are going to try and test it with Kaguya, but that is perfect for public inspiration. Real live images of things going on on the moon beamed to your living room. And you can even select the angle you view them at by pressing the red button. <laughs> <laughs> Tracking and navigation. You wouldn't want to get lost on the moon. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's even worse than some places in the UK I won't care to name for fear of uh, embarrassing anyone who comes from there. But seriously, it's a very featureless place. It could be very easy to get lost or get disorientated. So if you have astronauts there and they need to get back before their oxygen runs out, you want to help them navigate. And of course, if you're beaming other companies or agencies' data back, it could be similar to pay-as-you-go, but pay-as-you-transmit. You could actually make money by having a communications capability there that um, charges people per bit or kilobit or megabit of data that you transmit back. So this is something that's being explored slowly at the moment, bearing in mind that we haven't yet got the low-cost orbiter, but we think we have a route towards that. So finally... We have a choice in this country. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the picture there. This is ExoMars. Uh, Aurora is the European Space Agency's exploration program. This began around about 2001, 2002, so what, seven years ago. ExoMars will not launch until 2013. No, no, actually, they just changed it. I think it's now 2015. Maybe it'll go back again. Who knows? It tends to slide to the right by a year every year. And it's going to cost the best part of a billion euros. Oh, this is also the first mission of the Aurora program. So wait a minute. What I'm telling you here is that 2001, they initiated an exploration program. It's going to be at least 14 years before anything happens. And it's going to cost a billion euros. Now, Colin Pillinger used to like saying, well, for the cost of the Beagle 2 mission, it's the equivalent to what people in the UK spend on hair care products in a year. Now, depending on how much hair you have, you may or may not disagree with that. Um, but a billion euros, that's a lot of hair care products and a lot of other things. That's a really staggering amount of money. It doesn't need to be that expensive. And we've looked at what the minimum cost would be to go to the moon. Penetrators will add to that cost, and there's very good reasons for doing that, for the science reason. But if you want to go to the moon, to put something in orbit around it, to get those camera images, to inspire young people, and to act as the first stepping stone to a much bigger exploration program where you eventually land on the surface, you launch penetrators, you could do that for 10 million euros. There's a bit of a difference, as you can tell, as in two orders of magnitude. So really, the choice is yours. Most of you are taxpayers. You're all interested citizens of the UK. You have some influence, depending on whether you choose to exercise it. Where do you want to go? What would you like to see in the next few years? Do you want the UK to pour money into the effectively bottomless pit of Aurora missions like ExoMars that may even be cancelled? Or would you rather say, let's fund some small missions that get results quickly? I didn't put the time scale on there, but we could have that small mission on the right-hand side, Lunar Light, we've called it, lifting off in three years' time, if there were 10 million euros there. Three years, that's not long. That's a PhD. That's a few years at school. People could get involved at the start and really achieve something before they moved on to other things. So the choice is yours in terms of what you ask the government to do and to support. Bear that in mind. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take the odd question. What do you do? You maybe check out the hardware that sat on the moon's surface for a while. Do you have to ask the owner's permission? 
I would imagine if you wanted to sample it, as in physically go up and touch it and remove bits, you would be wise to ask permission. Um, although there's probably some subtlety of space law that says after it's been there for 25 years, it, you know, copyright expires. But you could gain a lot of information by simply putting a spectrometer up close to it. Um, mm -hmm. It's an interesting question, though, that I think probably a lot of people haven't thought about, mostly because there's not yet the ability to go up to things of choice on the moon. But the issue of claiming parts of the moon, the first to land, could have mineral rights or rights to whatever they find there, is hotly debated at the moment. Did they get much... Uh, the, the, when the Americans were there, they went to one of their previous probes and brought bits back. Did you learn much from that? I believe there was some knowledge gained from that. I don't personally know what it was. Uh, possibly some members of the audience may be aware of that. But really, you're looking for a sort of exposure data. So what happens to sensitive detectors or optics or metal structures for support? And I think because the Apollo program was well underway at the time, they had limited chance to use that data to do redesigns. But I think the conclusion was that for short periods of exposure, anything up to a few months, uh, they had no worries on materials. Now, if you're going to put a base on the moon that's going to use advanced materials like Kevlar or carbon fiber composite, it's going to sit there for five, 10 years or more, that's a different set of questions you have to ask. And that's why you need low cost missions to be the pathfinder to put some samples of material down there to see what happens. Otherwise, you're putting your astronauts under a really quite significant risk. Thank you. Do, do you know the Google Lunar Prize? And do you plan to participate in this? Well, we're aware of the prize, and we've given it a lot of serious thought. We're going to the moon anyway, and we will ultimately land there. And if we land there before anyone else does, we'll claim the prize. But we're not going to let the requirements for that prize drive what we're going to do in SSTL and in the industry consortium. So you have to do certain things. You have to do a precision landing. You have to... Uh, uh, I think get samples from a certain radius, you have to do it for under a certain amount of money, you have to have no government money involved and quite frankly that is actually very difficult. So our view is if we started chasing that it would distract us from our real mission which is to show how to do a low cost orbiter and then something that can do some surface science as well. So we're interested but we're pursuing our own route. Uh, you mentioned astronomy. Uh, it was my luck to lecture for 30 years uh, at Marlborough, uh, which has the best telescope on the ground. Um, it was interesting to see my uh, students. When the question of when the moon came up, we learned an awful lot about the moon in, from 1956 to 1986, when I stopped. Um, and uh, the, uh, it is said that Darwin's origin of the species killed religion for some people and our knowledge of the moon between 1956 and 1986 killed it from nearly everybody else. What's your comment? Gosh, that's a rather controversial topic to address on a Friday afternoon. Where do I start? Um, <laughs> no. Um, I think that as we explore the moon more, we will answer some or begin to answer some of the more fundamental questions. I don't think it will necessarily change the, the devotion of the many millions of people around the world who believe in God in its various forms. And I would even be so bold as to say that science and religion are not irreconcilable. They're just perhaps different ways of viewing things. Um, I think exploration and finding out about how things formed and why we are where we are is a key thing to do. And many of the astronauts, in fact, who've done that have been quite devout uh, worshippers. So I think it will probably not change the world significantly. If we go to Mars and find life, that may be a different question. I think that will pose some interesting theological questions for our religious leaders, but the moon, I think, will merely broaden our understanding a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for the very exciting presentation. Not just very informative, but also educational as well. Okay, um, let's once again. <laughs>